Jacob must overcome his genetic flaws, his upbringing flaws. There's been flaws in every one of these patriarchs we've been studying. And here it is, the last week in February, and we are still in Genesis. And the first week in March, we will finish Genesis. And we'll continue to work through major stories in the Bible about moving forward with faith. But this is an important moment. This week in Broken Brothers, my message, Jacob must go from being a broken, selfish brother to becoming triumphant with God, his new name. You see, Jacob, as we said before, was straddled with an unfortunate heritage. His name meant liar, and he went right to work on his name, and he was a liar and a deceiver from the beginning. And he deceived his poor brother Esau. Now, his e Esau had his issues too. He was, you know, he was skilled with a bow, and so Jacob should have been paying attention to that. But he was impulsive, too, you see, because dysfunction runs in families. And the things that we teach our children, they pass on to their children. And so, Abraham, Isaac, passed on these traits to Israel. And so, in the impulsiveness and the hunger of Esau... Jacob seized his opportunity to be the deceiver and to become not just a deceiver, but a deceiver, a liar, and a thief at the same time. So it seems fitting to me that the thief and the deceiver gets deceived by his father-in-law. You see, what we do, how we treat others, has a weird way of coming back on us. And Jacob started out his life deceiving Esau and gets deceived by, by, by Laban, his own father-in-law. But at the end of that deception, what we can say good about Jacob is Jacob understands after being the deceiver, being the thief, and having been deceived, and having been robbed of what was promised to him, he understands that he has to find a way to make this right. Now, if we can learn anything from Jacob, one of the things we should learn is that when we've made mistakes, when we've messed up, we should try to find a way to make it right. I mean, <laughs> Jacob has a little bit of motivation here. I, I did tell you that Esau was good with the bow. He was a skilled hunter. He was a brawly kind of guy. And Jacob had learned that he couldn't stay forever with Laban the deceiver. And having started out his own family and becoming his own man finally, he decides that he must make things right. There comes a time when we must grow up. There comes a time when we must put away, as the Apostle Paul would tell us, the things of our childhood. There comes a point in time when we must make peace with our past. And so Jacob seeks to do that, and so he sends a messenger... He sends a messenger to Esau. And it's a really interesting message he sends to Esau. Hey, Esau, I'm successful. This is a kind of a weird way to try to mend this relationship. I'm successful. I become my own man. You know, I went and I worked for, for Laban. And, 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 you know, I have my own flocks now. I have two wives. I have all these children. Laban may have deceived me, but I came out on top. 
And so Esau answers. And the messenger comes back. Oh, great. I'm coming for you. <laughs> I'm coming with you with an army. In fact, the messenger comes back and says, I'm so glad to hear you're successful. Me and 400 men are coming to check this out. Now, Jacob is distressed, and he's like, maybe I didn't go about making peace the best of ways. And I think we'll see a pattern of this when we get to Joseph next week, who also doesn't know how to make peace with his brothers. You see, we really do pass these things on to our children. And that is why we must make them right. So that our children will learn how to make them right. And so, Jacob is like, I got to come up with a plan. He thinks, I got to divide my family up. So like if Esau comes and kills them, he only gets half. And then I can run in and try and save the other half. And he sends his wives and children away and, and hides them. And, and, and then he just starts to pray. Have you ever been in that place where you, where you can't see the way out? Have you ever been in that place where you just want to protect your family and keep your head down? Well, that's Jacob. And he's like, I just got to pray. And I just got to see what God is going to do in this situation. So he just starts pouring his heart out to God. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau. And I love his honesty, for I am afraid. He will come, attack me. And also, the mothers with their children. You see, his concern is not just for himself. His concern is also for Leah, who he's finally learned to love. And all of his children. Both daughters of Laban, the 12 children, the daughters of the concubines, we will call them, in polite language. And he's motivated to save not just himself, but them. This is why he has strategized to separate them so that they don't all perish. And what I really love about this, and I just really hope that we can grasp this, as successful as Jacob has become, and he's very successful by the time he leaves, he's not too successful to get down on his knees, shed tears, and cry out to God for mercy. You see, sometimes when we get too successful, sometimes when we're too self-made, sometimes when we get really talented at solving problems, that, that, that we don't think we have to have this dependency on God. So I say, thank God that Esau was skilled with the boat. And I say, thank God for the fear that produces in Jacob, because that fear in Jacob, knowing he can't hide forever in Laban's house, forces him to deal with his past for the sake of his future. Because he appeals to God for what God promised in the future. But you have said, that I will surely make you prosper, and I will make your descendants. So don't kill my children, because you said that you would make me prosper, and my descendants be like the sand of the sea that cannot be counted. So God, I'm afraid. God. I'm successful, but God, none of that matters if you don't make your promise come true in my life. 
Can I tell you something? You are well within your rights to ask God to be accountable to the things he has promised you. In fact, God provokes us to hold him accountable to the things that he promises us. When God sees us hold up our fists and say, why? You promised me more. He doesn't get mad. He sees faithfulness. He sees someone, believe me, despite the odds, despite the fact that there's an army of 400 advancing on me, despite the fact that I can't defeat my brother, Jacob says, but you promised me, and I believe your promises over the reality that is marching up upon me. Come on, church. Is that the kind of faith you have? Do you believe the promises that God has made you? Come on, be with me this morning. Do you believe the promises God has made to you despite what is marching up upon you? Despite what you see happening, despite COVID, despite the pandemic, despite unemployment, despite it all, God has promised that there will be a remnant church. God has promised that his church will be victorious. God has promised that this gospel will go to the world just like Jacob knew. My descendants must be like the sands of the sea. You promised. I tell you, church, it would be good for us to hold God accountable. Because if you do, it's WWE time. If you do, it's World Federation wrestling time. If you do, God shows up to your fight. And I find it completely fascinating that God shows up to the fight. It makes you believe that he's the enemy. Like, I don't know what Jacob thought. He's there praying his heart. He's like, God, honor your promise. Don't let Esau come and kill me and my family. Please, you said that we would be the descendants. What is going on? And then, like, he's praying, he's sleeping. Yeah, you've yeah, been there. Like, like, you're trying to pray, but you're tired. Like, you're just... And suddenly, someone seizes on him. I'm sure he thinks it's Esau. <laughs> like, why wouldn't he? That's what he's praying about. Don't let Esau come and kill me. And bam, someone grabs him. His heart was already beating before the fight. He was already in terror. You see, when you're scared, when you're afraid, and God provokes you to more fear, That ain't bad. That's not bad. He wants to see. He wants to see in life or death. He wants to see in the dark tunnel at the end. He wants to see when you are seized upon a power that won't let you go. Do you believe the reality that you're living or the eternal promise you've been given? And so they wrestle, it says, all night long. And in verse 27, the man who is wrestling with him, who doesn't identify himself at this point, asks, what is your name? That's a weird thing to ask someone in the middle of a fight. 
It's, yeah, it's a little weird. Like, like you're supposed to notice it's weird. Like, you're in the middle of this fight. One won't let go of the other. They're like, let me go. No, you let me go. Yeah. Hey, by the way, what's your name? Liar. Liar, he answers. Liar. Could it be that in the middle of the fight, God wants you to know who you are? Could it be in the middle of the fight, you find out who you are? And who you will become. God is forcing Jacob to come to terms with Jacob's own behavior. You see, no real repentance, come on, follow me, church, no real repentance ever happens without an admittance of your sin. Jacob is like, I'm successful, Esau. Come and look at how many wives I've got. Come and look at how many children I've got. Come and look at my herds. See that I don't need to steal from you anymore. And God is like, look, you can be as successful as you want. You can be as polished as you want. You can have the wealth of you that you want. But you've got to come to terms with how you got it and who you are. And Jacob is like, I'm a deceiver. I'm a thief. And I'm a liar. I've been in that wrestle with God. Has God pinned you down? made you face the reality of who you are without him. What name? Don't say it out loud, even if you're at home. Someone may hear you. But I want you to process it. If you are in a battle for your life with God, and he asks, who are you really? How have you really ended up in this fight? What name? In the quietness of the battle, everyone is gone. He has sent everyone away. He is alone at night praying when he's attacked. What name, when no one else was watching, when you were alone, and it's just you and God, and God is like, it's time to be honest. When no one else can see, who are you really? What would you say to him? Don't, don't say it out loud. That's just for you and God. But understand, there's no lying at this point. And God doesn't want you to clean it up. God wants to know if you get it. God will have an answer. And in 28, God says to Jacob, the man... Standing in for God says, Your name will no longer be deceiver. Your name will no longer be thief. Your name will no longer be liar. Your name will no longer be chaos, which is what mankind generally is, as we've been learning that God is reordering our chaos. Your name will no longer be transgressor. Your name will no longer be sinner. Your name will no longer be doubtful. Your name will no longer be Thomas. Your name will no longer be like Peter the Apostle with a foot halfway in your mouth at all times. Your name will no longer be James or John crying for fire to come down from heaven and consume other sinners. 
Your name will no longer be Aaron making the golden calf. Your name will no longer be Noah getting drunk off the ark. Your name will no longer be Adam or Eve or Cain. But Israel, because you have struggled with God. And, you see it? You struggled with who? God and humans. And you have what? Prevailed. You're prevailed, or to borrow the language from Marvin's appropriate song this morning, you have overcome. You have overcome your tendency of who you are. Why? Because you are willing to be honest with me. You see, all you need to be an overcomer is honesty with God. Look, you don't, look I am not a priest. You don't have to go into a booth and be honest with me. Frankly, in some circumstances, I appreciate your not sharing everything with me. But the thing is, you must be honest with God, and it's when you're honest with God that he can do something about it. When he comes to you and he's like, okay, you want my promise? You want me to make it come true? You want me to fulfill what I told you? Who are you? I hope this morning, if you go away with anything, you go away honestly talking to God about who you are. That you start the dialogue if you've not had the dialogue. Like, you might not be in a crisis of faith, but why wait till then? I wish. I mean, like, Jacob was called Jacob from birth. It would be so much better. <laughs> he would have dealt with this before he got married. And, any women out there are like, yeah, men need to deal with their stuff before they get married. Anyone? <laughs> Jacob is like, he's waited too long. So you don't have to wait that long. If you have waited long, you can deal with it now. Better now than later. But I promise you, we all get that point. <laughs> in this life or in the judgment, we have to be honest with God about who we are. Who <sighs> gets this? No. You're Israel. You're Israel. Now, there are two different ways you can interpret the name Israel. It can mean you struggled with God or you triumphed with God. Isn't that interesting? Like, I looked this up in several sources because I'm not a Hebrew scholar. So I looked it up in several sources, and it, it can come out either way. Either you've struggled with God or you triumphed with God. Let me tell you something. You're all Israel. You're all in the struggle. The question is, will you keep struggling or will you let God triumph in your life? <laughs> God is like, I don't want you to be what you were. I don't want you to be what Isaac thought you were and Rebecca thought you were. I don't want you to be the man that Leah married or Rachel married. I don't want you to be that man who would get the maid serve a servant because the wife tells you to. I want you to be a man who knows that I honor my promises and I will make what I said come true in you. I want you to not be Jacob anymore, but to be Israel. And the rest of the Old Testament is the story of Israel vacillating between struggling with God and triumphing with God. Struggling with God? Triumphing. And if you read the Old Testament carefully, when God is mad, he's like, oh, Jacob. <laughs> and when God is happy, he's like, oh, Israel, come to me. Hear me, oh, hear me. Jacob looked up. And there... There was what? 
Esau, the skilled hunter, the bowman, the Riley guy, the guy with the sensational appetite that can't be quenched. Esau is the man's man. You know, like, I, I just see him with tattoos. I know he didn't have tattoos. But I just see him with tattoos and a beard. He was hairy, yeah, that's true. He got that bow over his back, and I just see him coming like, like a freight train. And he's got 400 of the most riley hell's angels with him that you can imagine. And... Jacob looks up, and here comes Esau coming with his 400 men. And so he quickly divides Rachel and Leah and the children and the servants. Look, he's, he's keeping those servants around. They're his baby's mamas. You know what that means, right? He's a little bit ahead of Abraham. You with me? He's a little bit ahead of Abraham. He ain't sending his baby's mamas away. He may have made the mistake, but he'd take responsibility for it. That's part of becoming Israel. Part of becoming Israel is claiming your mistakes, owning your mistakes, being accountable for your mistakes, and not sending your baby mamas away. There's a lot of men that still need to hear that. There's some women who need to hear that too, about baby daddies. But sometimes you don't get a say in it, Abraham and Sarah. But that's why I say Jacob is a step ahead of Abraham. God didn't call Abraham Israel. Made the same promises, but never called him Israel. This is advancement I want you to see. He put the female servants and their children in the front, and Leah and her children, and Rachel. And it's interesting. Joseph in the rear. And this will become interesting as we proceed next week. He himself went on ahead. Oh, he is really being a man. Come on, man. You've seen it, right? He taken responsibility. He divided everyone else up and put them in safe, strategic positions. He's going to face this head on. Because he know that God gave him a new name. You know what it means to be a man? You know what it means to be a person of integrity? It means you can bow down and humble yourself. You see, I always know when a politician or a leader or a teacher or a pastor is a fraud because they always be building themselves up and never be really willing to bow down. Never being willing to humble themselves to their mistakes because that's what real leaders do. That's what real fathers do. That's what real people of integrity do. They're not above making it right. Even when making it right means submitting yourself to someone you don't want to submit yourself to. He bows down, not once, but seven times. And please do not miss the significance. 
Seven in Hebrew is the number of completion. He is doing what Jesus did in Philippians. He is kenosis. He is emptying himself out before his brother. He is humiliating himself to completion. He is in complete submission. I, like, like, I know we got this nice dog called Oreo. I should have put a picture of him here. But Oreo is like one of the most humble dogs I know. The smaller the dog, the more he will bow down and crouch himself and be in submission. Not just the big ones, but the small ones too. Because he wants the small ones to know he's safe. See, that's what Jacob is doing here. He knows he's got the promise. He knows God told him that he's going to make it come true. He could go out there proud. He could have his fur up, up on the back. You, Harry, you, you see, help me put my hair up. But that's not leadership. That's not integrity. You see, Jacob is not trying to get God on his side so that he can win against Esau. Jacob is trying to get God on his side so that he is on God's side, and that's key. Jacob is at peace with his past now. So he approaches his brother submissive. Even now, the former Jacob has questions if God will save him. He knows that God gave him a new name. He knows the promise, but maybe you're there some days. Maybe you're there today. Maybe you're there when the mortgage payments are struggling, or when you're trying to decide, will I pay my tithe this month or not? The question you need to ask yourself is, are you done being who you used to be? And are you ready to believe what God says you're going to be? And as soon, I love it. I love it. Get ready for the home run. I love it. He's out there. He's got his family divided up into segments trying to <laughs> save some descendant in case God lets him down. He's done his homework. He's taken the leadership of his family finally. He's leading the way and he's humiliating himself for the betterment of everyone. And Esau runs up and lays a big, fat bear hug on him. And then the biggest man kiss you ever saw. I know that makes some of us feel awkward, man, but, but there's a cultural thing going on here. I don't got that cultural, just to make that clear with you guys. But there is a cultural thing happening here. Esau runs up there and he grabs Jacob in that bear hug and he, he throws his arms around his neck and he starts kissing on his brother. And weeping on his neck. And he's like, who are all these people? It's like, he, he knows because the messenger went and told him about all the bragging rights, remember? But Esau is responding to Jacob's new humility. He's being the good brother. And he's like, who are all these people? And so, and, you know, there, there you have it. There, Jacob is introducing his family. And, and Esau's like playing all innocent, right? Like Esau's like, and, and, and what are all these gifts? Look, I heard you're successful, but... 
I love this. I, I love this because this is the way men of integrity act. People of integrity. But this is the patriarchs, and so it's about the men leading. And we'll, we'll get to Deborah later and that kind of stuff. But right now it's about the men leading. And, and they're both having integrity. One is bowing down, the other is showing him integrity back by not rubbing it in. See, in the past, that's what they did to each other, right? Oh, you're hungry? Oh, I got the stew over here. You see, but they're showing each other integrity now. Who is this lovely, beautiful wife? Two beautiful wives? And this Joseph in the back, what's he all about? Tell me about your, what are all these camels and gifts all about? Because I know <laughs> yeah, you, you don't give things away easy, Jacob. That's kind of <laughs> not the way you work. <laughs> so, so, so come on now, brother, what's this about? <laughs> You're hearing it, right? It's there. You just got to, you sometimes you got to just dig into these stories. <laughs> I love it. Esau's like, what's the meaning of all these flocks and herds that I met along the way? Jacob doesn't try to save his shame. He's a man of integrity now. He's like, brother, I owe you. Like, brother, I come to make things right. I appreciate you humbling yourself and meeting me halfway, but this fight is mine. I did this. I did it, brother. And I just want to say I'm sorry. I just want it to be right between us again. I just want to find favor in your sight, in your eye. I want when, come on now, Esau, I want when you look at me. You don't see the man I was, you see the man I'm becoming. I want when our descendants talk about Israel. That they got good stories to tell about me. I want to break the pattern of our daddies and our granddaddies and our grandmamas. Because, you know, Sarah. But Esau, he's meeting him every step of the way because that's what men of integrity do. He's not like, well, you know, I could use a few more of those sheep. Does this really make it even? I mean, you're going to be the promised child, and I'm going to get, what, a couple flocks? No, no. These aren't twins fighting in the womb. These are grown-ups. Listen, Jacob. I got my own. Listen, Jacob. I, I, I'm no longer upset with you. Listen, Jacob. You don't owe me a thing. Listen, Jacob. You done stole the most valuable thing. But we were kids. I don't expect you to pay me back. I'm also a new man. I'm also a complete man. I also know how to take care of my family. I already have plenty. My brother. You keep what you got. But Jacob, He's a new man. Please accept the present that was brought to you. God has been gracious to a thieving liar like me. You have a reckoning going on here. 
I don't deserve even what I got from that cheating son of a father-in-law. Yeah. Even what I got away with from that cheating son of a father-in-law is more grace than I deserve. He's really grown up now. God has been gracious to me, and I have all that I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted. In a way, this is Esau's submission to You ever been in that match, like you maybe you're out to dinner with somebody and no, I'll pay, no, I'll pay. And they're like, no, no, I will pay. No, no, I will pay. No, no, no I will pay. No, I will. And it's just like someone's got to pay. And sometimes even the competition to be humble becomes about pride. Come on now. I come to tell you the truth today. What did Willie Nelson say? Oh, no, I'm quoting country song. Something's gone wrong. When I start quoting country song, oh, look out. It must be the Holy Spirit because it ain't me. Oh, Lord, it's so hard to be humble when I'm perfect in every way. Right? Some people will take humility to the point of making being humble about pride. But they did the appropriate amount of, no, are you sure? No, no, I want you to have, uh, but, but, you know, I'm okay. Yeah, I know you're okay, but, 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 but I owe you. Well, if, if you insist, then I, you know, this is, what is this? I mean, like, come on, this is a guy who had to steal from his twin. He had to lie to his twin. Who is this new man? Who is this new man? The other man didn't believe in God enough. To believe that God would bring his promises about. That he had to be a liar and a deceiver. And a thief. God don't need that kind of help, folks. This is not Jacob. This man is Israel. This man is finally a brother. You can make a nation out of this man is a man whose lineage should thrive. This man is finally, finally, finally a brother. You know why this man is a brother? You know why this is a man to follow? You know why this is a man that we can trust in the famine that's coming? Do you know why this is a man God chose to name a whole nation after. Because he struggled with his identity before God. And the text told us why. I pointed it out so I could make this point now. Because when he struggled with God, he was struggling with humans. God needs you to know before him who you really are. Because if you don't know before God who you really are, you will never go faith forward. If you don't know before God who you really are, you will forever be stuck 
in the trashy relationships you end up in. You see, no one can ever have healthy relationships with humans until you have an honest relationship with God. You see, Jacob is finally an overcomer. Did you catch it in the text today? Jacob is finally an overcomer. Jacob is finally an overcomer because Jacob knows who he is. And God told him, that's who you think you are. You, my son, are my Israel. You, my son, are my promised one. You, my son, are my overcomer. You, my son, are finally, all the way back to Genesis 6, your brother's keeper. And I can trust, listen, I can trust the fate of humanity. That's what God is doing. I can trust the fate of humanity in a person that can be honest before me and let me direct them in the way they now go forward and behave in their relationship. You see, they, 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 Jacob gets the integrity Jacob gets the past of his mistakes. And that's why God can change the future of his relationships. Now, not to go too big for you, but just to go big for like a second and get out of your way. This is the struggle of Israel all through the Old Testament until Jesus stands up in Luke 4. It's that I come for everyone. I come to free the oppressed. Israel keeps wanting to go back and be Jacob and make it about their inheritance. And God is like, I only brought you to this point for you to understand. It's about triumphing for Esau. It's about triumphing for the other nations. It's about showing them how I made even a lying, thieving deceiver try for my cause. Listen to the team.
bad days through.